Greetings, my name is Grant Potts, and I am an Associate Professor of Religion at Austin Community College. Uh, welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the work of two um, major thinkers who have influenced the modern study of religion, Max Weber and Clifford Geertz. Uh, I've put these two together to discuss, uh, partly because uh, this lecture is designed to go along with my class on the introduction and the uh, study of religion, introduction to comparative religion taught here at Austin Community College, and partly because um, I think these two thinkers really, really do have a common thread, and that's that uh, although they're both social scientists, they tend to emphasize an interpretive approach to understanding religion. We'll see what that means. If you have followed my lectures before, or if you have um, been a part of my class, you will know that I emphasize two major traditions in the academic study of religion. One is the social scientific tradition, which tends to emphasize an idea that we need to study religion to explain it using the tools of the social sciences, whether that be sociology, anthropology, psychology, etc. And that in doing so, we're really trying to have a scientific understanding of religion. Um, and there's another tradition which I usually refer to as an interpretive tradition. It's sometimes called a, a religionist tradition, or even maybe uh, more specifically, the phenomenology of religion. And this tradition tends to hold that the goal of the academic study of religion is really understanding, not explaining religion, but understanding it. Understanding what that religion looks like for someone within that religion, understanding what religion is in itself as a phenomena. Um, the many people who study religion formally will be inspired and gain um, methods and theories from both traditions. Uh, but you do have some level of diversity between the, those traditions. What's interesting about both people we're going to look at today, Max Weber, who's a German sociologist from the turn of the century between the 19th and 20th century, and Clifford Geertz, a very influential cultural anthropologist from the mid to uh, late 20th century, um, is that both are squarely within the social scientific tradition. They're both clearly people who think of themselves as social scientists, who work as scientists, who think of what they're doing as a scientific analysis of religion, but who really emphasize the importance of interpretation, the importance of not simply gathering data and running through formal analysis, but applying the mind of the interpreter to really try to discern and understand what's going on and to communicate that to the broader scholarly community. Well, let's start by talking a little bit about Max Weber and who he is. Max Weber um, is a economist and a sociologist. He's considered maybe one of the founders of modern sociology uh, from Germany. He himself trained in history and law and um, at the University of Berlin, Berlin at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and then he went to teach at the University of Heidelberg. Uh, what's interesting is that most of his work, uh, his major work was completed, it was really published, um, completed and published either uh, in the last 20 years of his life after he left the University of Heidelberg or after his death um, in 1920. Weber left the University of Heidelberg uh, because he had some sort of mental breakdown. Um, we don't necessarily know exactly what was going on. Uh, the records that would have helped us understand that were destroyed by his wife. It may have involved some issues in his family, uh, his extended family. Um, he was experiencing family issues and tragedies within his broader extended family, his birth family. Um, there may have also been issues with his marriage. Um, we do know that he and his wife remained uh, married, and she was able to... Um, execute his estate after uh, he died. And part of why we don't know a lot of what happened here is that she destroyed a lot of the records around his wrestling with mental illness to try to protect his work from criticism from the Nazi party. Uh, so um, we do know that he did not complete his classes in 1899 and he entered into a mental health institution for about a year and then functioned primarily as an independent scholar for the rest of his life. Uh, he did advocate within a, a, a debate that was happening at the end of the 19th century, primarily amongst historians in Germany, uh, who were debating whether uh, history the, as a human science 
um, and really it was a debate uh, about the nascent social sciences, whether they needed to develop a, um, a completely explanatory uh, scientific approach like the natural sciences, if they should model their methods after the natural sciences, or whether they had an independent set of methods uh, really driven by an interpretive approach. And he really advocated for that interpretive approach of understanding the social world. Um, that we couldn't simply, in the human sciences, look at human beings in this way we look at the natural world and really understand what's going on. He wrote a wealth of books. Um, he edited, um, or, or he participated in publishing in various academic journals. Probably what's most important for the academic study of religion uh, was his 1904-1905 publication, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which was actually uh, initially published as a series of articles. Um, his later work, Economy and Society, that wasn't published until after his death, uh, which included a large section on religion, which is often uh, printed as just a single book called The Sociology of Religion in English, and then a large book series which began with The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism called The Economic Ethic and uh, the, the Economic Ethic of World Religions, where he planned to survey the religions of the world, the Abrahamic faiths, and the religions of Asia, and in each of case, examine them as social and economic systems. Um, he did, of course, finish the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and he also finished a volume on the religion of China and the religion of India, but that project did not um, come to completion because he died rather suddenly at the age of 56 of pneumonia. What Weber is most known for is his work in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. In that, he puts forth a thesis that is often called the Protestant ethic uh, thesis, and uh, or or the Weber the just the Weber thesis. Um, it's contested. Know that there are many people who see problems with this thesis, but to date, it still holds as a major theoretical contribution to understanding both the relationship between religion and um, the economy and economic life and to the study of the rise of capitalism. Put most simply, Weber was wrestling with a problem. It was a problem that many economists and social thinkers in the 19th century, like Marx, who influenced Weber's thought, um, had, which was how did capitalism come about? Uh, capitalism is an economic system that we know emerges in the 17th century and 18th century. Uh, it really has its own forms, modern financial systems, the accumulation of capital, the joint stock company, etc. It has its component ideologies. Uh, and it emerges out of, we, we usually discuss capitalism as emerging out of a, a prior economic system known as mercantilism. Put simply, the, the question that, that Weber confronts is, is why people would even begin to engage in capitalism, because capitalism, um, although it may, once it emerges, seem to make sense, seem to provide satisfaction to people, seem to drive a lot of economic activity that seems rational, actually, on its root nature, isn't very rational. Um, why? Why is that? Well, first, got to realize what capitalism is and what drives capitalism. What really drives capitalism and distinguishes it from mercantilism is that it is driven by the need to accumulate capital, accumulate money. Now think about that for a second. What really needs to happen for capitalism to arise, which really requires people who want to accumulate money and then reinvest that money in various enterprises, whether that's um, joint stock companies, corporations, uh, financial investments, banking, is that they need to be interested in uh, taking that wealth and then putting it to, into a process that will generate more wealth, where the goal for a human being is really to acquire as much money as possible. Now, why does that seem nonsensical? Because money is not really worth anything in itself. Money is only valuable, if you think about it, because it, it helps you buy stuff. It helps you get stuff. Uh, it helps you gain wealth. Um, either hire people for services, you know, like going out to a nice restaurant and getting the service associated with that, um, or to invest in things that make your life more comfortable, more pleasurable, etc. Uh, 
But what really has to drive capitalism, he argued, is an entire culture which is not interested in that wealth, but is interested in gaining what I guess we could think of as the symbol of wealth uh, the, the, and puts value on money itself and not what money can buy. So he said there had to be something. There had to be, quote, a manner of life so well adapted to capitalism that it had to originate somewhere, and not in isolated individuals alone, but as a way of life common to whole groups of men. He really was saying that what we, what we need to do is have a set of ideas, what we think of as culture, what he might describe as a superstructure of ideas and processes and behaviors and ethics and uh, whatnot, that leads to a set of behaviors that then give rise to certain social and economic forms uh, that will then drive uh, the economic life that defines capitalism. And he asks, where does that? And to answer that question, he begins to look around. Where does capitalism emerge historically? Well, we know that capitalism um, really seems to take hold in the low countries of Northern Europe, uh, what we think of as the Netherlands and Belgium today, uh, where we have some of the first corporations, uh, groups of people, and, and the beginning of modern uh, financial systems and banking. Of course, you know, banking also has roots in Italy and in England, but we really see a capitalism take off in the Netherlands and in uh, the Bel in Belgium, in the Low Countries, uh, during the 17th century, as the joint stock company is is born, and as a group of people begin to uh, engage in this process of investment in various instruments to gain more money. And who are these people? These people are the Puritans. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, the people in, in Weber's thesis who drive the development are, of capitalism are the Puritans who are rooted in a theology uh, that was developed by John Calvin. And so he sees in them a particular ethic uh, we, you know, in other contexts, we might call it an ethos. And when we're talking about an ethos, we're talking about a whole way of life. We're talking about a set of uh, ideas about what's right and wrong, um, what, wh how that relates to a worldview, and, and what kinds of behaviors that suggests are the right things to do. Um, and so the Puritans participate in an ethic called the Protestant ethic. What are the components of the Protestant ethic? Well, to, to develop these components, to, to, to figure out what these components are, what Weber does is he starts looking at various figures he associates with capitalism, uh, like Benjamin Franklin, for example. Um, but he, when he investigates them, he pushes earlier and earlier and sees ideas that he sees, say, in a figure like Benjamin Franklin as having their root within an earlier culture. Benjamin Franklin, for Weber, is, is kind of the uber capitalist um, because he puts a lot of emphasis in work, he puts a lot of emphasis in investment, in having this, this very methodical life, um, in gaining, engaging in a life uh, that is primarily based around being a, a you know, a good person who uh, works hard and doesn't engage in frivolous activities, uh, where there's a certain calling to be uh, a, a person who contributes to the world, uh, who makes the world a better place, um, and doesn't just waste it on luxuries. And how much Benjamin Franklin actually fits that mold is another question, but in some of Benjamin Franklin's writings, he certainly advocates that. So looking for where this comes from, he, he pushes back into some ideas coming out of the Protestant Reformation. And one of those ideas is Martin Luther's idea of the calling. Um, he suggests that we, we need to have this idea that um, that you are called to do a work in the world by God, that Luther puts out. Um, that you are really, um, that this is, there's a moral justification for your worldly activity, and that's that you are, are driven there by a sense of having a particular duty to engage in the world in a particular way uh, through a calling by God. Now, that's not enough, of course. Um, Martin Luther's calling is, as he, as Weber points out, very traditional. Um, what's really important is that uh, you are uh, driven by grace to trust in God and penitent faith to, uh, um, to engage in a godly life of piety um, and serving the word of God. 
So this calling needs to be matched with some other ideas, and those ideas come from John Calvin. Uh, if you've studied Calvinist theology, you'll know that uh, Calvinism is probably uh, most distinguished and marked by an idea of predestination. Uh, John Calvin emphasized the glory of God and the majesty of God, and in his examination of the majesty of God and reading of the Bible, he came to a number of, of pretty radical ideas, and ideas that even people who are in Calvinist traditions like Presbyterianism often don't realize are there, uh, like um, the idea of predestination, that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, so he has decreed everything that happens, every breath, every flutter of a butterfly's wings, every thought we have already exists in God's minds. It's already destined to happen. Um, and one of the consequences of that idea is the doctrine of election. There are sinners and there are saints. There are people who are going to um, go to heaven and people who are going to go to hell. But in Calvin's theology, that decision is already made by God because of predestination. We cannot command God's hand through works. Luther already argued that, but we also cannot command God's hand through some sort of piety. We do not command God's hand. God is all-powerful. God commands us, and we live out the lives according our lives according to God's will. Uh, so we, we can't necessarily make ourselves, we can't save ourselves, I guess is what I'm saying. We are already elect or we are not. That said, uh, and this is where um, we begin to see the interpretive approach of, of Weber take place. That said, Weber says, well, let's get in the, the psychology, the social psychology of this. What kind of world do you live in if that's what you think, that you're, there's a, a, a doctrine of election? Well, there's a lot of ideas in, in, in Puritan culture that really emphasize that one cannot struggle over this. One has to be confident in God's love. One has to accept God's love. Uh, that one, you know, has to recognize and believe that one is of the elect. I mean, it, it's a horrible world if you think that you're not the elect, um, if you are constantly struggling with this. And there's a, there's a certain anxiety here that then drives people to, to participate in a particular way of life and look for signs of that election. And out of this emerges what he calls worldly asceticism. So classically, asceticism is withdrawal from the world. Monks, nuns, whether they're Buddhist or Christian or whatnot, uh, withdraw from the world. Uh, they, they don't participate in wealth. They don't participate. They, they may have vows that cause them to eat simple meals or eat very little. Um, they take vows of celibacy. They live simple lives. Uh, they try not to be caught up in the world and the pleasures of the world, etc., what is unique and what he sees as necessary for the development of capitalism um, is this idea of worldly asceticism, an idea that we should engage with the world. We should engage with the world, but not, not revel in it. We should look to the world as God's creation. We should live out our lives. We should accept even maybe the joy that's there in a limited way. But we should not um, be frivolous. We should not um, indulge in the pleasures of the flesh that lead us away from God. Now, th another part of his ethic is that um, Calvin is, is an extremely uh, rationalized form of Christianity. He's very analytic. And this rationalization of the religious system um, pervades Puritan thought. And so there's also this very um, methodical, analytic approach to life that is a necessary component of this, such so as organizing life and creating the kind of bureaucratization even of one's own life that can give rise to capitalism. All of these come together then to create a set of behaviors that allow capitalism to flourish. Let's think about this. All right, let's think about what he's talking about with worldly asceticism. You know that there are those who are chosen, who are elect, but you don't know if you're one of them. But you really have to think yourself one, or else you're just going to give up, and the de temptations of the devil will overtake you. As Weber says, one, on one hand, it was held to be an absolute duty, and this is amongst Puritans, to consider someone oneself chosen, 
and to combat all doubts as temptations of the devil. In the place of humble sinners to whom Luther promises grace if they trust themselves to God in penitent faith are bred instead in Puritanism, those self-confident heroic saints whom we can discover in the hard Puritan mergents of the heroic age of capitalism and isolated instances down to the present. On the other hand, in order to attain self-confidence, intense worldly activity is recommended as the most suitable means. So, in order to, to really have that self-confidence, that you are the chosen, you need to engage in the world. You need to engage in the world, and you need to participate in the world. But not in a way that leads to temptation. You can... You can go out and work hard and even gain the fruits of that work. Now, here's the key. Even gain the fruits of that work. But you don't want to, um, to indulge in them. You don't want to live merrily and without care, but with stoic focus on the destiny of your soul. He states, wealth is thus bad ethically insofar it is a temptation to idleness and sinful enjoyment of life, and its acquisition bad only when it is with the purpose of later living merrily and without care. So wealth is only bad when it tempts you, and when you waste it on yachts, comfy couches, or buttons, or any other things that you know uh, might be frivolous indulgences. But as a performance of duty in a calling is not only morally permissible wealth, is not only more morally permissible, but actually enjoined. You actually, there's actually this sense that you need to um, engage in the wealth of the world. To wish to be poor, it was often argued during this time. Uh, the same was it was often argued the same as wishing to be unhealthy. It is objectionable as a glorification of works derogatory to the glory of God. So what we see here then is an ethic then in his mind, which drives people to want to accumulate wealth, but not participate in the fruits of that wealth. So having gained that wealth, having gained that capital, what do you do? What is the morally um, right thing to do for Puritans? It is to reinvest that. And that drive to reinvestment then gives uh, rise to the kinds of uh, investment vehicles corporations, modern financial banking, etc., that gives rise to capitalism continues to do so. Uh, I mean, you can think here of Warren Buffett as kind of the ideal Weberian capitalist uh, because he he is very driven. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. But if you know anything about Warren Buffett, he's you know, rumored or he's often celebrated to not really indulge in his wealth. Uh, he lives in a relatively simple apartment in uh, New York City, I think uh, he doesn't. He doesn't buy lots of yachts or huge estates or spend it on you know ex extravagant things. And this ethic, and it's an ethic that we actually hold a lot in our own society, and we just accept without even thinking about like, well, why is that even sensible? I mean, why is it sensible to acquire lots of money, money, but not actually spend it on good things that actually you know make life awesome, like, you know, a really nice boat that you can go and enjoy yourself on the ocean with. Uh, we just sort of accept that. And and that is is really the ethic of capitalism that he's seeing here. Now, Weber did not just write about capitalism. He also wrote extensively about other forms within religion, and he, and he goes to a, a larger level of abstraction in economy and society or uh, the sociology of religion in exploring that. I'm not going to talk a lot about those various ideas in this lecture. I mostly just want to hit on the idea. You, and if you're in my class and you're reading our textbook, Kessler, you'll see those ideas come back. Um, I just want to kind of emphasize that one of the things he's he's particularly interested in, and to give you an idea of, of how he works um, on this kind of level of abstraction, is uh, is religious authority. How do people gain authority? And he develops a theory that that people initially gain authority through charisma. Um, what is charisma? Charisma is that kind of like interpersonal quality that attracts other people to someone. 
uh, in order to follow them, um, or they gain their authority through tradition uh, because they have an office or, you know, people in their family have had that authority, or they gain it by following a set of rules. And, and these, uh, for him, are modes of authority that evolve within a community, and particularly in religious communities, are often started by charismatic figures uh, who gain a following. Uh, their their uh, immediate um, crew, their... their their set of followers, whether it's the followers of the Buddha or followers of Jesus, um, then because of their association with that initial prophet, um, gain some sort of traditional authority that they pass down, say, through the priesthood, um, and that that eventually gets bureaucratized and rationalized into more formal structures of authority, uh, where the authority is really rooted in the legal structure of the church or the laws of the society um, as a whole in modern uh, democratic societies, bureaucratized societies, um, and it is removed from that kind of initial charisma. Um, and he looks at various forms of, of traditional and charismatic authority, whether it's prophets, priests, magicians, analyzes how they gain their uh, in prophecy. Uh, he sees the various forms of prophecy. So he's beginning to, he creates these models, what he calls ideal types, and begins to break them out and sort them out and say, how do these work? What are these, what models can we gain with for there? So we see this person of a prophet. How do they gain, they have a kind of charismatic authority. How does that work? Um, are there different ways they function? He actually creates this idea that there are, are emissary prophets who gain their authority by claiming that they are emissaries of some sort of divine or sacred force or God, and they're bringing a message. And then there's exemplary prophets who put up their lives, their own work, like the Buddha. There's, I have this method of attaining to enlightenment. Um, do what I did. And, and they um, are kind of a different form of prophecy. But all prophets basically function through uh, a charisma that they're able to bring about because of the story they tell. And this is really, you know, this is where, where he gets most interesting is sorting out how this works. Uh, so, for example, with a prophet, he says to the prophet, both the life of man and the world, both the social and cosmic events, have a certain systematic coherent meaning to which man's conduct must be oriented if it is to bring salvation and after which it must be patterned in an intricately meaningful manner. So what he says is that prophets, they see the world in a certain way and they can convey that to others. And what is that? They see humans, they see the world um, social events, cosmic events, as having a, a totality of meaning. They can kind of weave together all of the disparate experiences we have um, as their followers and give us a sense of a whole. Now, what distinguishes the prophetic authority from bureaucratized authority is that it's, it's not necessarily logically consistent. They actually, what, what gives them powers and ability to, to take things that don't seem logical and weave them together. Now, the structure of this authority, he goes on, uh, the structure of this meaning, uh, sorry, he goes on to say, may take varied forms, and it may weld together into unity, a unity motives that are quite heterogeneous, quite different. The whole conception is dominated not by logical consistency, but by practical evaluations. They give practical value, and there are practical results that come from that. So that gives you kind of a sense of Weber's thinking. And, you know, Weber is a deep well... Uh, I may, in the long run, record additional lectures on particular ideas in, in Weber's thought and put them up on YouTube for you to explore. Uh, but for now, I just kind of want to give you an introduction and suggest that, yeah, going in and, and studying Weber is certainly worthwhile, and, and there are many resources for doing so. But let's, at this point, let's move on to Clifford Geertz. Now, Clifford Geertz and Weber are, you know, like I said, they have a, a similar interpretive approach to their work. Uh, Geertz, though, is an anthropologist, uh, he's anchored in field work and going and, and studying particular populations, even though he then generalizes that to larger theories and meditations. And th there is a, a uh, connection between the two. Clifford Geertz, for a period of time, studied with Talcott Parsons, one of the major minds in the development of sociology in the United States. And Talcott Parsons, uh, although he's heavily influenced by Durkheim through that sociological school, is also... Um, influenced by thoughts like Weber's. And so there is, there is a, a, a lineage of thought between the two. And, and Geertz himself will reference Weber in his own work. Um, Geertz uh, taught at the University of Chicago for about 10 years after he studied at Harvard. Um, and then at, in 1970, he actually was asked to join the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton University. And I, I, what you need to understand that makes this significant and shows you how important a thinker he was at his time is that he's really the first uh, person who was not 
a hard scientist or a mathematician, like a physicist or a mathematician, who was asked to join the Institute of Advanced Studies. This is the institute where Einstein uh, was housed as well, and he was there until the end of his life um, in 2006. He's a very prolific writer. Uh, he wrote The Religion of Java from his initial field work. Uh, he went to Java and studied the Muslim religious culture there, wrote a book on it. He wrote a later book. He went to Morocco and studied Islam there and wrote a book called Islam Observed. Uh, he wrote a number of essays. Um, many of his early essays were gathered together into a book called The Interpretation of Cultures. Probably one of the most important essays is the essay we're going to talk about that's excerpted in Powell's Introducing Religion called Religion as a Cultural System. So in doing this, I do want to suggest that we're looking at one corner of Geertz's thought. And again, it may be worth coming back to Geertz later, uh, but at this point I just kind of get, want to give you a sense of, of how both men are working, which is to, to step inside a religious world. But what's distinct here is that there, as social um, scientific thinkers, there are two things going on. One, they're really interested primarily in social processes. They're not necessarily like many phenomenologists suggesting there is some sort of uh, potentially transpersonal force or cosmic force that might be operating there that we can discern through through comparative study of religion. Uh, they're really only interested in uh, the human world as it functions as a human world. Um, and secondly, they do they do tend to uh, be wanting to build models to, to abstract out from the particulars from this religion or that religion a sense of how religion functions as a whole uh, within this social sphere. Um, so that's that's really what we're seeing here. And that's what, what Clifford Geertz tries to do in religion as a cultural system. He really tries to lay out a theory of religion, a sense of what what is religion and how does it work within the cultural system. And Religion as a Cultural System is an interesting essay. Almost, uh, It's excerpted in, in the Pals book. It's almost all the chapter on Geertz. There's a little bit from Religion of Java and writings like that. But uh, it's a, an essay that's really built off a definition of religion he lays out and then a discussion of that. Uh, so he, he's, he's taking his life work, studying religion, and saying, hey, what can I say about religion? What, and he says, well, let's start by saying what religion is. Religion is, one, a system of symbols which acts to, two, establish powerful, persuasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men by, three, formulating conceptions of a general order of existence, and, four, clothing these conceptions in such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. So, you maybe have seen this before, especially if you're in one of my classes. We've probably looked at this before already when we were talking about definitions of religion. What he then goes on is to unpack that, to develop, you know, what am I saying here? What am I, what am I doing? And in doing so, to then examine and discuss how religion works. So he first says it's a system of symbols. It's a symbol of system of symbols. Um, so we need to understand what that means. It means that there are these symbols, whatever those are, that, that come together to create, to work as a system to do something. And the rest of the, the definition is the functional definition of what it does. Um, and he doesn't necessarily give a clear definition of symbols, but we see a sense of what's going on as he, as he works through the essay. And he talks about symbols as really these kind of um, fixations or uh, condensations of cultural ideas. Uh, so in symbols, uh, the culture, the ideas of the culture that are shared between our psyches, we know we have psyches, we have ideas in our mind, uh, we, we share those ideas through symbols and they get condensed into kind of a material form. Um, so what are symbols? They are symbols or at least symbolic elements, and here he's talking about very symbols like the cross and whatnot. He says they're symbols or at least symbolic elements because they are tangible formulations of notions abstractions from experience fixed in perceptible forms, concrete embodiments of ideas, attitudes, judgments, longings, or beliefs. So all this stuff, and not just sort of a reference of, of some particular clear and distinct idea like we have in philosophy, uh, but moods, beliefs, longings, judgments, attitudes, all
all of that gets condensed into a symbol. To undertake the study of cultural activity, activity in which symbolism forms a positive content, is thus not to abandon social analysis. And this is one of the things he's suggesting, is that if we're going to study symbols, we're not moving away from the social and trying to find some sort of deep meaning uh, that is behind the social. Rather, cultural acts, the construction, apprehension, and utilization of symbolic forms are social events like any other. They are as public as marriage and as observable as agriculture. We can see them and we can see the symbols interacting in the social field with behaviors, with institutions, etc. And through that, we can begin to understand what's going on. So part of what he's suggesting is that religion is cultural and social. It is foremost cultural and social. And so if we're trying to understand the symbols of religion, we're not moving away from the social. We need to understand the social context, and we need to see that as a window into the social context in a particular way. And how we do that is we understand what those symbols are doing. What are they doing? They're establishing powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men. Uh, moods and motivations that really drive human beings, uh, that are everywhere, that are throughout the society, and they're persistent. They last over time. Uh, what are what are these moods and motivations? Well, to figure that out, you know, why does he say moods and motivations? He's really talking about our affective life, how we feel, but he sees that happening in two different ways. There are motivations which drive us in particular directions to do things and moods which inculcate us in particular feelings that may not necessarily um, in and of themselves lead to particular actions. The major difference between moods, he says, and motivations is that the, where the latter are, the, mo the motivations are, so to speak, vectoral, qual vectorial qualities as they move in a direction. The former are merely scalar. That means they just have a, a sense of intensity. Motives have a directional cast. They describe a certain overall course, gravitate towards certain usually temporary consummations, completions, we might say. But moods vary only as to intensity. They go nowhere. How do, how do symbols do that? So they establish moods and motivations. Sorry, I should have had this slide up. I kind of skipped ahead um, without talking uh, about it. Uh, but they establish these moods and motivations um, by, he says, formulating a general uh, conceptions of a general order of existence. So those symbols really give us those feelings by giving us these concepts, these ideas, these senses even, of a general order of existence, a way of being. Um, and in, the, in this part of the essay, he ends up sort of exploring, well, what does that mean? Well, it, it means meaning. It means that what, what Weber was talking about, what the, pro, what the prophet does, which is the prophets give us a world. They give us a sense of what the totality of being is, because without that, we confront chaos. We confront, as I've talked about with Durkheim, enomi. We confront a, a, a senselessness, a sense of unpredictability, and which can be completely debilitating, which leads to depression, which leads to meaninglessness, which can even lead, as Durkheim uh, taught us, to suicide, uh, to a sense of a complete loss of, of everything. And much of what religion does is combat that. Uh, if you're in my class, you'll know that we, we explored this when we examined theo uh, theo not theophanies, um, when we examined the problem of evil and examined how religions supply answers to the problem of evil. Well, Geertz see this is happening in a number of places. There are at least three points, he says, where chaos, a tumult of events which lack not just interpretations, but interpre interpretability. And, and I think this is part of what I... I you want to see with Geertz. He's not saying that religions supply us with answers. They supply us with a framework for, for at least feeling like we can work out the answers and a process for engaging in that. Um, there's, a, there's three points where, these, where chaos threatens to break it and upon man at the limits of his analytic capabilities, at the limits of his powers of endurance, and at the limits of his moral insight. So things don't make sense. Whatever analysis we do, we, we can't make sense of the world. Um, we can't you know, we can't explain things, uh, or we 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 suffer. Uh, we can't actually endure life because it's too hard, or because we, you know things are are just hard to accept morally. We we have a sense of a moral being, but it doesn't line up with reality around us. We have a sense of of what makes a good person, but we see that that. You know, in being a good person, you get screwed over, and other people uh, are rewarded who who seem to to be not fitting the moral code. All of that challenges us. And what 
what religion does is provide symbols that give this general order of existence, that gives a cohesive interpretability to that. It supplies us a way, a way with sorting out the big issues in life. And, and you know, it's not just the big issues, but also the little issues, as we'll see. Um, there is... A, a, there is a way in which that meaning is projected. It saves us from anomi, but it also gives us a way of life that gives us a sense of identity. I mean, part of what he, he also suggests is that part of what makes religion so hard for people to, to um, deal with if their religious ideas are challenged is that what's being threatened is their sense of being, their sense of identity. It's a psychologically difficult place to be. And again, here, notice the, the attention to that to getting inside kind of the psychological sense of what it is to be in this religious world and why one would grab it. There's, a, there's again, a social psychology here. Um, so what, it's not just making those ideas, not just giving those ideas that meaning. I mean, art can do that, right? Um, it's not just giving us that, that that religion does. But religion close these conceptions, close this meaning with an aura of factuality. With an aura of factuality. It makes it seem real. And in that he says, you know, to understand this we have to really look at other ways that people have a sense of the world around them. They have a sense of meaning. And he sees that three other ways that he compares. Common sense, scientific reason, scientific endeavors and art. All of these are ways that people make sense of the world, gain meaning of the world. We have our, our kind of common sense day-to-day -day meaning. You know, we, we, we know that if we, uh, you know, do this and that, that certain things are coming come about. Um, it makes sense that, you know, if I go and to the river, I'm going to find, you know, water to drink, to, to nourish me. We have these kind of common sense ways of being. Um, we also have scientific perspectives, which rigorously a a analyze the natural world and, and build us a coherent period picture out of that. And we have art. And art, so, you know, through literature, through the plastic arts, through performing arts, supplies us with a sense of meaning as well. How's religion different? Well, he says the religious different uh, di perspective differs from these in, in different ways. Uh, it differs from the commonsensical in that it moves beyond the realities of everyday life to wider ones that are correct, that, that correct and complete them. So common sense is really about our day-to-day -day lives. And religion puts that in a larger frame, puts us in a larger sense of reality that corrects and completes our, our, our understandings of our day-to-day -day lives. Further, it differs from the scientific perspective in that it questions the realities of everyday life, not out of institutionalized skepticism, but in terms of what it takes to be a wider hypothetical truth. So science, science um, really arrives at its own picture of reality through institutionalized skepticism, through constantly questioning that picture. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the, the radicalities of the scientific perspective is that, that it is really rooted in this intense questioning and doubt. That's what marks a scientific theory is that it's, it's falsifiable. It is structurally built to be torn apart. And in, in the scientific endeavor, we continue to refine our understanding of the world by continuing to tear it apart. Um, whereas religious perspectives are... There, there's a wider set of hypothetical truths um, that we judge other things by. And you can really see this in, in, the, in the, the evolution creationist debate. If you've ever watched any of this debate recently, it becomes very clear that, you know, part of why science critique creationism as, a, as you know, a theory uh, on par with a scientific theory from a scientific perspective is that uh, creationists are not interested in in tearing apart their theory. They're not they're not built off skepticism. They're built off faith. Um, they're interested in working out how that faith perspective, those hypothetical truths, um, can best match the evidence. And, and and it's hard to pull off because you know a lot of what religions do is they don't necessarily um, hold up to that kind of rigorous skepticism. Uh, that's why many religions develop uh, attitudes of hostility to skepticism. Uh, and, and combat skeptics as heretics, as those who deviate from the truth. Uh, they try to hold together a cohesive worldview. Uh, 
Um, and, and, you know, there's reason to that, and there's potentially even benefit to that uh, in terms of producing social order um, and potentially in, in attaining the goals, uh, whatever those goals are, like salvate goals of salvation, say, within the religious system itself. Um, science isn't interested in that. It's really interested in in in, in institutionalizing skepticism about those truths. Uh, and so, in some ways, it, it's not as it's not as good at supplying that sense of a total meaning because it calls everything into doubt. Um, it throws us back on that chaos constantly. And it differs um, from art, he says, that instead of affecting a disengagement from the whole question of factuality, it deepens concern with fact and seeks to create an aura of utter actuality. And now, now note that he's really um, rooted here in a theory of aesthetics that really sees art um, as functioning because, because it's not real. Uh, and, and that's, in, in aesthetic theory, that's a debate on whether art functions by, by separating us from the real. But there is this idea that art works because it, 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 it takes us away from, from the real and allows us to participate in something uh, that is not factual. Uh, we see the, 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 the actors on the stage, we know, we know that they're not real, but we gain meaning because of that. Now, the question is, how much does that reflect back? Um, into real issues of factuality, art can be engaged in, say, social and political processes. But that said, what do he really sees religion as doing? He's very concerned with facts and seeks to create an aura of utter actuality. So religion tries to create this sense that things are completely real. We could debate all of this, of course, with Geertz, just as we could debate with Weber. Uh, but first we have to understand what their theories are. And he thinks that what religion does is create that sense of facticity. What is the consequence of that then? The consequence is that the moods and motivations that are instantiated by symbols seem uniquely realistic. They have that power that he attributed to them. They are, are, are totally real. They're totally real. So when I see the cross, when I walk into a church, that calls in me a sense of the presence of God, let's say, uh, that is tied to this whole map of how I understand the world to work, that supplies me with meaning, and that sense of the presence of God seems uniquely realistic to me. It is in this placing of proximate... Uh, 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 okay, so yeah. And so I'm... this. Let's... To get this quote down, I, th I think I want to back up to this image. Let's think of this. We're, we're engaging in this act. We walk into a church. We see the cross. We have this feeling. We, we have a, and we're, maybe we're called to, to then, uh, uh, that, that feeling calls us to, to a motivation. So that's the mood. That presence of God is a mood, a motivation. And we say, you know what? I, I've been, I've been wasting time. I, you know, I spend my, my weekends playing video games instead of doing what I should do, which is going out and helping the poor. And so we go out and we do that. So there's all these, these proximate acts, these, these acts that are just the, the, the immediate acts of our lives. It is this placing of proximate acts, these, these immediate acts and ultimate context that makes religion frequently at last socially so powerful. Because it takes whatever's happening here now, me walking in the church, me doing the work I think I need to do, and it puts them in this huge context of the ultimate destiny of my soul, of the universe. I am participating in the work of God. It alters, often radically, the whole landscape presented to common sense, alters it in such a way that the moods and motivations induced by religious practice seem themselves supremely practical, the only sensible ones to adopt, given the way things really are. And so it creates a world, and a world that makes sense to me, and where the actions I take make completely uh, make complete sense. Even though someone from a different world, a different culture, a different religion would look at that and say, what are you doing? And that makes total sense. And I know from emailing with many of you, or talking to many of you who are my students, you, you have these questions. You're, you're, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, I'm wrestling with this religion, like Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, or if you're, you're someone who is not religious in, in a Christian culture or with Christianity itself, you know, you're saying, I don't understand why people believe this stuff or why they do these things. I, and I'm trying to. That's the work. And what he's saying is that part of what you have to understand is that that world that is created for them becomes their world, becomes real, and motivates acts, and motivates 
uh, a way of being. And that's why religion is so powerful as a social force. So I, I hope you do get a sense for, you know, we looked at Weber in a kind of particular question, what's going on with the rise of capitalism, and then talked a little bit about him more generally. And then with Weber, we looked more at the building of this general theory. But in both cases, what they're doing is building a theory that really tries to say, how does religion work from the inside out? How can we interpret and understand what's going on in those religious worlds? Uh, and they do that then by creating these, these theoretical frameworks uh, at a level of abstraction that can be applied to a number of different contexts and supply us with ways of saying, oh yeah, oh look here, this is, I see this mood happening, I see this, this um, symbol working in this way, I see how this creates this sense of things for, for these people. Um, and then we can begin to understand what's going on, maybe refine and build off of uh, these ideas. Of course, in, in both cases, we're dealing with with older theories, they, they, there may be ways we can test with that. We understand things maybe work in a different way. Uh, but both continue to have lasting influence on the academic study of religion. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and that you got some, some real uh, benefit in terms of your understanding of how uh, those of us who are professional scholars of religion do our work.